And it truly is my privilege now to introduce to you Michael Liebreck, founder and chairman of the advisory board for Bloomberg New Energy Finance, the world's leading provider of information on clean energy and carbon markets to senior investors, executives, and policymakers. Michael serves on the UN Secretary General's high-level group on sustainable energy for all, as well as the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council for the New Energy Architecture. An Olympian, while a member of the British ski team, a leader in charity, and a father of three, Michael is also someone who walks the walk when it comes to climate and in our environment. In 2014, he received a Clean Air City Award for his personal contributions towards improving the air quality of London. To provide us with his perspectives and to introduce us to Mapping the Gap, please help me in welcoming Michael Liebrecht. Thank you so much. I'm actually going to come around here. Um, I've been looking forward to this all day where I get to say, uh, my name is Michael from Bloomberg and I have an announcement to make. Um, I, I'm, I'm not standing for uh, President of the United States. I, uh, um, Thank you. Before I start, I'd like to just rec recognize the leadership of, uh, of Betty, your colleagues, and also just the broader, uh, the Calpers Calsters broader uh, investment community in California. When I started New Energy Finance, one of the first news stories uh, that we covered was actually the launch of uh, the Green Wave Initiative, um, which is now about 12 years ago. And I can tell you right now that that leadership spurred a wave of innovation in the financial services sector. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, risk and we're going to talk a little bit about opportunity. Um, and I'm going to start, if this works, there you go, with the figures that everybody has been uh, mentioning very kindly, the figures uh, for investment in clean energy. Uh, if we go back 15 months when the oil price really started to collapse, I cannot tell you how many times I was asked but not really asked, I was told that renewable energy investment would now stall because of the uh, drop in oil price. Of course, most renewable energy competes uh, in the electricity markets, unlike oil, but I was told uh, by many commentators that this was it. And this is really a stunning uh, riposte by the clean energy industry, reducing its costs, and clean energy investors continuing to commit funds to clean energy, $330 billion. The definition here, by the way, is renewable energy plus energy efficiency and a few other things like power storage. Um, if you include large-scale hydro to this number, this is the, it's not in those figures, but if you include it, you get to a number of $380 billion in 2015. I like that number. Um, those of you who uh, are aficionados of the divest invest movement, which we, uh, I, I'm, uh, I neither support, I, I, call, I, I watch it, but I don't, I'm not here to advocate for it. But 380 billion is also, by chance, exactly the figure of large scale oil and gas projects cancelled in 2015. So it's a very, uh, it's a, an absolutely clear illustration. The, of what is happening in the energy markets, you're seeing big oil and gas investments cancelled and investment in clean energy uh, continuing. Um, 2015 was also, uh, as you can see there, the green line is renewable energy, the other line is fossil fuel, and you can see that renewable energy uh, investment, now this is um, in, just on the electricity generating side of things, renewable energy investment has outgrown uh, fossil fuel investment. And if you look at things on a geographic basis, and the Secretary General already mentioned this, what you see is more investment for the first time in the developing world than in the developed world. So there's a lot of myths collapsing here. A lot of myths collapsing. Renewable energy as alternative energy. If you do one thing for me after today, please never refer again to renewable energy as alternative energy. When you see it's out investing, uh, outgrowing <laughs> fossil fuels. And the other myth, the second myth, is that somehow clean energy is something only for rich countries. Uh, once you've developed, then you can deal, uh, you have the luxury, the wealth to invest in clean energy and we can see 
here that the developing world is out investing and the reason they are doing that increasingly is because it makes sense economically. Countries have different trajectories. This is now on a quarterly basis. The red line is uh, four quarters rolling, so it's an annual uh, figure there. And what you can see, this is China. China is the rock star of clean energy investment. It started by um, investing in the technology, probably mainly as an export industry, but quickly realizing how quickly the costs could come down. Uh, clean energy, renewable energy, is a mainstream part of China's energy mix and becoming more and more so, driven by understanding of the cost, driven by air quality concerns, driven by climate concerns, and locked in by that historic deal last year with the US, whereby China will move to 20% zero carbon energy, uh, electricity by 2020. So uh, China investing $110 billion last year, country number one in clean energy investment by a fairly large margin. This is the US. Anybody who says policy doesn't matter, look at this chart. You'll notice uh, that it's on suspiciously what looks like four-year cycles. <laughs> Those of you watching uh, the upcoming presidential debate or the alternative event being put on in Iowa, um, think about where that red line might head in the next four-year cycle and think carefully. Um, that's Japan, now the third largest country um, there, uh, the dramatic increase that you can see in renewable energy investment has a much sadder um, catalyst, which was the Fukushima uh, catastrophe. Before then, it was all going to be about nuclear. After Fukushima, nuclear, which is now coming back online to a certain extent, but renewable energy clearly got a big boost, and Japan is country number three. But then you get to... Um, a much more troubled region, Europe, which was the first region to invest at large scale in renewable energy, really led the way. And, you know, in the early years when I started New Energy Finance, everybody, wanted, everybody in here in the US wanted to know um, what the Europeans are doing and how do they do it and what policy mechanisms do they use. And Europe's leadership in clean energy was relinquished really around the time of the second financial crisis, sort of around 2010, 11. That is um, Germany, still committed to the Energiewende, to the shift in, uh, in energy to renewables. Uh, but you can see there, struggling to attract the large-scale finance that it attracted uh, three, four, five, six um, years ago. That is uh, the, that's Italy. That is Spain, the famous retroactive policy changes. I mean, policy really matters. You can see here, we're hoping to see uh, some unsubsidized merchant solar, particularly coming out in Spain because it's now so cheap. But we can see there uh, the worst boom bust cycle of any country. Um, that is France, um, unfortunately. Uh, Ségolène, or well, perhaps fortunately, Ségolène Royal is not here to see um, that for all the tremendous achievements in Paris, we still need to see a little bit more in terms of uh, uh, renewable energy investment in France. And the, um, the real bright spot in Europe is the UK. The UK has shown the most rapid uh, growth. It's been the largest market for renewable energy uh, of any European country for the last couple of years. Um, but now a new policy environment really threatens that. And we're almost certain to see those numbers um, dropping uh, at least somewhat. But what we're also seeing is new countries coming on board and actually seeing large-scale investment. There you've got South Africa, and you, know, you can see it's, it's growing to two, three billion um, in the good, well, five billion in the good quarter, so averaging uh, a few billion a year. This is a large-scale investment opportunity. That's Mexico, fantastic renewable resources, uh, working very hard to liberalize and, re, um, uh, and, and introduce competition, dynamism into their energy markets, and we see renewable energy benefiting. That's Chile, a fantastic solar resource, uh, strong economy, so we see investment, and that's Morocco. So you see these new countries coming on board, and that's what's driving um, that shift from developed to developing world. This one's very interesting. This is India. Uh, of course, Mr. Modi has put energy at the heart of his attempts to accelerate the Indian economy, to bring people out of poverty. 
and within energy, renewable energy has to pe play a very substantial part. And there you can see, so far, no substantial Modi bump. It has recovered, investment levels have recovered to where they were in 2010, 2011. But if he's going to deliver the numbers he's talking about, the numbers that we're all talking about, the numbers that we're flying to Delhi to talk about, uh, if that's going to be delivered, we need to see acceleration pretty darn quickly in those investment figures. That's something we'll be watching very carefully. Of course, underlying this is the cost drop. This is not because there's been more and more subsidy lathered onto this industry. This is because, in fact, as subsidies have been dismantled, the costs have dropped more quickly. What you can see there on the left, uh, this was uh, a year ago, a project in Dubai. This was the solar equivalent of the shot that was heard around the world, a project at under six cents unsubsidized per kilowatt hour. So in the Middle East, a solar project producing electricity more cheaply than you could produce it using natural gas. That is an, an eye-opener. That was a wake-up call, uh, not just in the region, but around the world, because it was not from one of the large countries. It wasn't in the US or Germany. It was in Dubai. And most recently, just a few weeks ago, the announcement of a wind project in Morocco, unsubsidized price, special projects, yes, long-term financing, fantastic wind resource, but three cents per kilowatt hour. This is probably the cheapest new electricity that, uh, that you could possibly build anywhere in the world right now. And of course, wind is intermittent, solar doesn't, sun doesn't shine at night. When you get electricity this cheaply, you're bit, you, you have to buy some as a utility. You still have to deal with the intermittency problems, but you have a budget to do so, especially in these countries where wholesale electricity prices can be very high. This development towards renewable energy is happening really fast, much faster than the conventional wisdom would have it. What you've got here is the forecasts produced by uh, the IEA. I have enormous, huge respect for the IEA, for Fatih Birol, its head, for the work that they've done over years. But on the left, wind. On the right, solar. And those lines are successive forecasts of volume and the little diamonds are the outturn. And I can add two more to those. What you can see is that these technologies, they're quick to build, their costs come down quickly, they're spreading geographically, they are overtaking forecast after forecast after forecast. Our own forecasts included at BNAF. Where we're going with this, this is um, renewable, uh, intermittent renewables, and you can see where we are today, or 2014, the country with the mostest was Germany, 16%, and where we're going, uh, that's 2040, and that's under a business as usual, Germany, 77%, Australia, 52%, China, Japan. Now, as investors, you should be looking at this and thinking opportunity, because this is intermittent renewables. Not only does it have to be built, paid for, investors have to earn a return, but also the electricity systems into which it's sold have to be modified. There has to be investment in managing that intermittency. That's where your money is going to be going. Now, there are also losers. There are also losers. Here you've got the two largest utilities in Germany. That's their share price. And the blue line is the DAX composite. And you can see that starting very clearly in 2010, the two diverge. And the share prices of RWE and E.ON have gone from index back to 100 in 2007. You're now looking at 20, whilst the DAX has gone up. Why 2010? Why do they diverge then? I would argue it's because at that point it became clear just how com competitive renewable energy is, and these companies had not moved early to invest in it. The renewable energy in Germany is owned by communities, it's owned by individuals, not by RWE and E.ON, and they are in trouble as a result. And we see them talking about splitting into different units uh, and so on, having to take drastic corporate actions to try to catch up. That's the coal price. You've got there two indexes of coal. 
And again, we've seen there, that is, uh, that is the, um, the slow glide path that we've seen. Um, could it bounce back up this year or next year? To a certain extent, yes. But we're, it's absolutely clear what is happening to coal. And I would argue, I think, I'm not sure who it was today said, oh, it's happening in the developed world, but not the developing world. It's happening pretty much everywhere, with the exception of India, where the plan is massive investment still into coal. That is the Stoll Stow Global Coal Index. Uh, if you had had the wisdom uh, to, uh, uh, to put $100, uh, or given this audience $100 million, in January the 13th, January 2013, that would now be worth uh, somewhere around uh, $20 or $20 million respectively. That is oil and gas did well until the oil prices dropped, and that is clean energy. This, by the way, is um, there was lots of discussion about divestment. I'm not even sure you need to divest when the uh, indices are doing this. I call it divestment through value destruction. You know, <laughs> You don't have to go through complicated processes. Just hang on to your coal shares. This is what happens to them. Um, now, this is, this is what... There was some discussion um, uh, on the panel just now about what is uh, the risk... What is transition risk? This is Mark Carney, and he said there's three sorts of risk, physical, liability, and transition. That is a transition risk, that you are invested heavily in coal and the world's energy markets go in a different direction. And what I would question... About, is in the next five years, Christiana said, we don't have 15 years, we have five years. Now, that's absolutely right. In five years, countries have to go to COP26 and put more commitments on the table. That's what success looks like. Paris alone is not enough. And I think transportation is the next area uh, to be looking at. This is oil demand. And that arrow there is the consensus official if you like, the incumbent forecast for oil demand back before 2000. It was, that it was just going to grow. China, India, other developing countries, it was just going to grow. Those are the forecasts that were produced. Again, this is using IEA, but you could use EIA or, or any of the major uh, oil and gas companies. That's 2000, 2007. That's 2010 to 13. And that is the current, the dotted line is the current forecast. The red dotted line is 100 million barrels a day, uh, and that excludes biofuels. And here's the question. If we get serious about transition, if we get serious about electrifying transport, if we get serious about a few things, then we could see that sort of outcome. So anybody who's expecting because a few projects were cancelled, that the oil price will inevitably spike. Those projects take out only two or three million barrels a day. These sorts of initiatives I'm talking about could result in a market where that capacity is never needed and the oil price never spikes back up. So it will go to the levels required to remunerate capital for the demand we'll see. Could we see $40, $50, $60, $70, but this would suggest anybody predicating their investment strategy on $100, $120, at any point in the future, is probably making a big mistake. And now, just back to Paris, I mean, because I, I don't want to talk too much about scary um, risk. Uh, I want to talk also about opportunities. Um, what we did... Seeing all the, I, the INDCs, the plans in Paris, we estimated how much investment, what, what we thought would happen, where we thought the energy mix would go, and how much investment would be required. There's lots of numbers start with uh, tri lots of trillions that fly around. These ones are 7 trillion, 6.9 trillion of investment in renewable energy and other low carbon, so nuclear, but also then large hydro. And, over the period to 2040, we're talking about $7 uh, trillion. But we need to remember this. What you can see there is the, um, the emissions. That was business as usual pre the INDCs, the green line. And you can see then the orange is the INDCs. We need to do a lot more than Paris for a two-degree scenario. And the exercise that Mindy and her team set us at BNEF was to map the gap, 
If you want to get to two degrees, what do you need to invest? Not business as usual or just the INDCs. What do you have to do to get to the dotted blue line? So there's business as usual, seven trillion, and there is what you need to do consistent with two degrees, and we're talking 12.1 trillion. So that means that there's got to be five trillion more. That's the gap between business as usual and what we need to see. That's the exercise uh, that's, uh, that we've been working on. That's the report that's being launched today. You'll be hearing a lot more about it, I think, in a session uh, with Ethan Zindler, my colleague who's sitting there. Uh, we'll be talking through some of the details. It's great work. I think you'll all get a, have, a, have a, an interesting read. What we do, we take the 12 trillion, we divide it into debt and equity, we look at the equity, we divide it into different sorts of equity, and the debt into different sorts of debt. So this is driving what is needed down really to the sorts of asset classes, the allocations that you are all making in your day-to-day -day work. And we're hoping, therefore, that this can spur really good, detailed planning uh, with your teams. So I started by saying we'll talk a bit about risk, we talk a little bit about um, returns or opportunity, uh, and where we are, I think, is a very interesting time. What have we heard so far today? I mean, we all know there's two things that move the capital markets. It's, uh, it's greed and fear, right? So we've heard, you know, we've got, we've got fear, we've also got opportunity, I won't use the G word, but you know, this is a pretty interesting time, so I wish you all uh, luck, and I look forward to tracking, my team will look forward to tracking uh, all of the flows of funds going forwards. Thank you very much. Well, let us um, again thank um, Betty and Michael for being with us and for such very, very interesting and clear presentations. I would say uh, the report that Michael referred to that Ceres and Bloomberg New Energy Finance are releasing today uh, is now available on the Ceres website. We are up to date. How's that, Michael?